okay we will start in 3 2 1 we are live a very 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 wonderful sunday to each one of us today we have another exciting webinar from mumbai hematology group they it is titled ptld post transplant lymphoproliferative disorder and on behalf of entas it's my honor and privilege to give a very warm welcome to each one of you firstly to the gentleman on the screen professor dr mb agarwal an institution a teacher of teachers somebody who has made uh, the academy a so so interesting and so much worth a lot of fun a warm welcome to our uh, guest speaker today dr dan and our chief guest dr vinas pofli thank you for we all look forward to listening your pearls of wisdom sir and all the esteemed discussant panelists across various parts of india today we have a huge number of them and we look forward to learning from their interaction today and also dr sanyal who is going to be the coordinator for the q and a round so may i request professor dr mb agrawal sir to take it forward from here good morning friends on this side of the world and good afternoon good evening to the colleagues from rest of the part of the world today's lecture is on post transplant lymphoproliferative disorder the speaker is dr dan derick from bang uh, belgium this webinar is brought to you by mumbai hematology group it is supported by intas and managed by my sides i thank dr manoj kumar and team from intas Mr. Rajesh and their team from Ice Ideas, Executive Committee of Mumbai Hematology Group, our chief guest of the day, Dr. Vinash Pofli from Nagpur, our guest speaker, Dr. Dan Derick from Belgium, all the discussants who are themselves eminent hematologists, medical oncologists, or transplanters from India, new participants from 14 to 15 countries for sparing your Sunday morning or afternoon or evening and joining us for this academic session. just to introduce you to our next weekend activities coming saturday 16th of april 7 pm ist we have managing difficult cases of chronic myeloid leukemia in 2022 an update from last ash by dr vivian oler she is from seattle fred hutchinson and next sunday morning 11:30 am ist we have myelodysplastic syndrome from dr austin Kula Sekhara Raj from London, UK. To introduce our discussants today, as Dr. Mano said, we have a good number of friends and colleagues around to discuss with Dr. Dan, Dr. Pranita Chakravarti from Kolkata, Dr. Siddharth Sankare from Kolkata, Dr. Prabhat Kumar Das from Bhubaneswar, Dr. Priyanka Srivastava from Anand. Dr. Darshana Rani from Mumbai, Dr. Vijay Ramanand from Pune, Dr. Sandeep Barthakke from Pune, Dr. Pritesh Chandra Patra from Bhubaneswar, Dr. Vikit Vivek Agarwala from Kolkata, Dr. Sisir Kumar Patra from Kolkata, Dr. Dev Deep Dev from Kolkata, Dr. Kripa Bajaj from Hyderabad, Dr. Murli Dharan from Mumbai. Dr. Rajat Bajaj from Kolkata, Dr. Kunal Goel from Kolkata, Dr. Akshya Mandolia from Kolkata, Dr. Devi Jyoti Prusti from Katak, Dr. Nakul Tikare from Bhubaneswar, Dr. Mopali Ghosh from Kolkata. Now it's time to introduce our chief guest of the day, and I'm privileged to have presence of my friend, Dr. Avinash Pofri from Nagpur. is a hematologist medical oncologist and a transplant physician he did his post graduation from nagpur and subsequently he obtained qualifications and certification from large number of countries across the world 35 years in the field including at various prestigious centers in various part of the world presently he is at the central Insti- india institute of hematology and oncology at nagpur post doctor guide for hematology he has written chapters in various books and international papers 
He has been a speaker for various national and international conferences. He's organized some very prestigious meetings in various parts of India. He's also organized important quiz contests for the postgraduate students. He's a pioneer for the bone marrow transplants in central India. He performed various bone marrow transplants of various types for various blood disorders successfully for the last 12 years. I request Dr. Avinash Pokhri to inaugurate our today's webinar and give us some words of wisdom. Over to Dr. Pokhri. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Agrawal. Thanks indeed for that nice kind words of introduction and also for inviting me as the chief guest for today's webinar. I must say that I owe a great deal of credit of my developing interest in the field of hematology to you, sir. I had attended your second CME in hematology at Bombay Hospital in the 1980s for the first time and was greatly impressed by the subject and mainly by an erudite personality behind the subject. As luck would have it, I worked subsequently in Saudi Arabia and in the UK in hematology specialty. Of course, I know that I'm just one of the many who were inspired by you knowing me or unknowing me. I did not stop taking lessons from you and your urge, enthusiasm, and passion to spread metallurgy to the general and specialty doctors. I tried to emulate you by conducting multiple conferences and CMEs in Central India in our field. And I thank you that as in many of them, you are the star guest speaker. And on a personal Lord, inspired by me, out of my three kids, two are all American board physicians. One is a lymphoma consultant in University of Wisconsin, and one is a fellow in Hemout at Harvard University, Boston. So the auspicious cycle continues. As for those young doctors who are wondering about venturing on hematology as their career, I have many things to say. I must say that you do not encourage someone by saying that you should be a hematologist. That is likely only when one gets an opportunity to see the fellows and consultants, how they are functioning, especially how they are enjoying working in the field, then only they can get attracted to the field of hematology. Slightly biased, as my major training is in UK, I believe that a complete hematologist is the one who is both clinical and laboratory hematologist and not the one who relies on reports from the lab and then his patient accordingly. He or she should be at least able to interpret the film and go down properly. That joy of taking a patient's history, clinical examination, interpreting the blood test, and looking under the microscope to correlate everything, making a diagnosis, and then planning the treatment is immense, that joy is indeed immense and is unique to the field of hematology. It might look daunting to some to be both a clinician and a hematopathologist, but once they start on, they are unlikely to look bad. The other skills hematologists need to possess are flexibility because hematology is so varied from day to day, you can get involved in the aspects of medicine, surgery, obstetrics, pediatrics, and more. You have to have compassion and empathy as you will spend most of your time taking direct care of patients who can be very sick. And you have to have a broad understanding of medicine as hematologists treat patients who often have complicated medical problems that rely on broad knowledge of the disease. So with such a fascinating specialty where opportunities exist for further multiple subspecialties, the world is your oyster. Now, I see the opportunity, opportunity to declare a webinar on post-transplant lymphoma disorder, PTID, with Dan Derricks from Belgium as the guest speaker, and following panel discussion with many of my good eminent hematology friends as inaugurated. I profusely thank Professor Garwal and Mumbai Hematology Group again, and I conclude here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Avinash, for those kind words, sparing your valuable time and being with us to bless all of us with your lovely speech this morning and inaugurating this webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next is the Sunday morning quiz.
as you know, that we'll be putting up this quiz in the next few slides. And the correct answer has to be mailed by you to mbagarwal1 at gmail.com. The winner will be fastest finger first, and we will announce names of all others who have sent in the correct entry. So we have a case, 62 year old man who was seen for progressive fatigue. His hemoglobin was five. There was lab evidence of hemolysis. Direct Coombs test was negative. There weren't any medications. We will show you a peripheral blood film of this gentleman and you have to make a diagnosis. Email your diagnosis to mbagarwal1 at gmail.com. Winner will be the fastest finger first. Now this is the peripheral blood film. We will show you a few more pictures, little different magnifications. You have to identify what is characteristic in this peripheral smear and put that answer by email. That's a closer view. And that's the last slide. Okay, so email your reply to mb, agar, wal1 at gmail.com. Winner will be the fastest finger of us. We now move on to the weekly case. This is another elderly gentleman, 68 years old has severe anemia needing multiple blood transfusions during last three months. His hemoglobin at presentation to us was 6.9. It was a normocytic normochromic anemia with a retic count, which is 0 0.1. Marrow aspirate and biopsy showed positive of the erythroid series. All this was done at PD Hinduja Hospital under care of Dr. Farah. And she referred this patient for an opinion after having made a diagnosis of acquired pure red cell aplasia and having ruled out thymoma, parvovirus B19, and drugs as the etiology. There wasn't anything in the history or examination or investigation to suggest lupus or rheumatoid. Patient had his... Uh, Second dose of COVID-19 vaccine two weeks prior to the onset of this rheumatological problem. There was some elevation in the liver enzymes, mild, but there was a history of alcohol to attribute. Hepatitis B and hepatitis C workup was negative. The repeat workup did confirm the acquired pure red cell aplasia. However, patient had mild lymphocytosis with an absolute lymphocyte count of 8,300. The peripheral blood film showed certain changes which were suggestive of the etiology of acquired pure red cell aplasia. And then the flow cytometry confirmed the diagnosis. This is not a quiz, so we are going to give you everything. You don't have to guess or write anything back to me. So this is the peripheral blood film, and those are the lymphocytes. A clump of them, an individual one over here and here. So they were large granular lymphocytes. And that was the flow. We showed these lymphocytes to be CD2, CD3, CD5, CD7, CD8, CD11C positive, and there was hardly any expression of CD4 and CD56. With this, we made a diagnosis of T cell lymphocytosis with secondary acquired pure red cell aplasia. 
So T cell LGA with acquired PRC, patient has been put on cyclophosphamide. This is just a week ago. So we do not know the response, which may take up to three, four months to happen. So that was the case of the week. Few publications related to this. This is a case series of LGA leukemia in Frontiers in Oncology published this year. This is a unusual case of acquired PRCA with T cell lymphocytic, uh, granular lymphocytic leukemia in a patient with autoimmune polyglandular syndrome type one. This is not exactly acquired pure air cell aplasia, it's isolated anemia in patients with large granular lymphocytic leukemia where once again cyclophosphamide was good enough to correct the HB of the hemoglobin. And this is a beautiful review of LGL leukemia from pathogenesis to treatment published in blood five years ago by Terry Lamy, who was our speaker for one of the webinars just three months ago. So that's for the PG students. And now we come to the main theme of the today's webinar. And it's my pleasure and honor to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Dan Derricks from Belgium. He obtained his medical degree at the KU Lewin an extremely prestigious university in the world, which ranks in the first 100. In 2006, he finalized his specialization as hematologist. Currently, he's working as a staff member in the Department of Hematology at the University Hospitals, Leuven, Belgium. His main clinical areas of interest include aggressive lymphoproliferative disorders, immune-mediated hematological disorders, and apheresis. In 2013, he obtained his PhD in medical science entitled Post-Transplant Lymphoproliferative Disorders Towards an Integrated Approach. His current research interest mainly focuses on the use of omics and new imaging platforms in rare lymphoproliferative disorders in particularly PTLD, in order to better understand pathogenesis and to look for new potential therapeutic targets. He currently is promoter of three PhD students involved in clinical and translational research on PTLD and other rare lymphomas. His national and international expertise in PTLD is illustrated by publications in several peer-reviewed and high-impact journals, including blood, and NEGM. In addition, he also serves as a reviewer for several journals. He will be now lecturing to us on PTLD, following which I will be giving you the answer to the quiz. And then my colleague, Dr. Subhaprakash Sanyal, will take over to run the question and answer session from the guests from India over here, as well as from the audience. So thank you so much and over to our guest speaker. Thank you very much. I will first uh, share my screen. Is this okay like this? Yes. I will go to the first, sorry. It was, uh... Yeah, okay. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Aswal and Professor Popali for the kind invitation. Thank you to the faculty. It's an honor for me to be here on this uh, webinar on post-transplant lymphomas. So these are my uh, disclosures. So as you can see in this um, figure, uh, PTLD is actually, or malignancies are a common problem following uh, transplantation. And this is caused by immune suppressive medication. And as you can see here, after 10 years of chronic immune suppressive therapy, the risk to develop a malignancy in general is about 20%. And of these malignancies, PTLD is one of the most commonly feared uh, malignancies carrying a high morbidity and mortality. And actually PTLD was described already in 1969, so more than 50 years ago by Professor Penn, who um, reported on a publication with four um, patients developing lymphoma following a kidney transplantation. 
So several registries have shown that the standardized incidence ratio, so that's the ratio between the observed cases and the expected cases in the normal population are about 10 or more for several lymphomas in transplant uh, recipients. And actually, we now know that there is a B-modal curve for PTLD. So you have an early spike uh, in the first year following transplantation, and then you have a kind of late wave, which actually is more a plateau, uh, lasting lifelong uh, following transplantation. And when we look at the distribution, uh, you can see here that for solid organ transplantation, about one third are early PTLD, so occurring in the first year, whereas the other are late PTLDs. And in hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, actually almost all cases are early PTLD. So you rarely see PTLD more than one year follow following uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. And when we look at the most important risk factor, the organ type itself is a risk factor. Um, several registries and several uh, single center and multicentric trials have shown that uh, multivisceral transplantation, so heart, lung, intestinal transplantation, carry the highest risk, followed by lung and heart as a monotransplantation, liver, and finally kidney transplantation, which have the lowest risk to develop PTLD. When we look at allogeneic stem cell transplantation, actually HLA mismatch is the between donor and recipient is the most important risk factor as these patients um, receive selective T cell depletions or uh, more ATG therapy making them at risk for developing uh, PTLD. And this is a nice publication from the Nordic Liver Transplant Registry showing that if you improve patient care, um, if, you, uh, if you have an, an awareness on long-term complication, if you incorporate cancer surveillance protocols and immune suppressive min minimization, that you can decrease the incidence of almost all post-transplant malignancy in particular uh, PTLD. So you see that when incorporating those um, precautions uh, that you that the standardized incidence ratio really decrease during the years. The second important risk factor and probably the most important um, independent risk factor is the EBV status at the time of transplantation. So if there is an EBV mismatch and in particular, a recipient that is at the time of transplantation EBV seronegative, who is transplanted from a seropositive donor, they have a high risk to develop PTLD, especially in the first year, as you can see here. But actually, this risk uh, is um, present lifelong. And this probably explains why children uh, who, are, uh, who have a higher prob probability to be EBV seronegative at the time of transplantation have a high risk to develop PTLD compared to the adult population. And we all know now that EBV is, 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 yeah, can, can promote tumor uh, development and that's why the WHO has classified EBV as a biological carcinogen. And EBV can cause um, lymphoma in immune competent uh, in immune compromised patient, as you see in red here, lymphomas, but also smooth muscle car sarcomas. But EBV is also involved in the development of lymphomas and carcinomas in immune competent patient. And there is now more and more evidence that EBV also plays a role in several other disorders, including, including uh, multiple sclerosis. And EBV associated um, disorders and malignancies actually is a worldwide problem. And here you see the estimated incidence worldwide of EBV related cases in 2020, showing that actually it's estimated that about uh, 300,000 cases worldwide are uh, seen every year with EBV associated malignancies, and that these are associated with a high uh, mortality. So EBV is a common problem uh, regarding cancer. A third important risk factor is, of course, the immune suppression itself. And here you have a difference between solid organ transplants, um, in which, uh, of course, you have often an induction regimen based on monoclonal uh, antibodies. Then you have a combination maintenance therapy. 
And this leads to actually the two types of, e of PTLD. So you have the early spike, which is mainly EBV driven and is caused by that induction regimen. And then you have the late wave of the late plateau, which is caused actually by the cumulative immune suppressive intensity of the maintenance therapy. In hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, it's different as I already told. So you have uh, the, the, the most important risk factor is the HLA mismatch and the T cell depletion uh, therapies. And so you have the first wave uh, of the early spike, which is due to the conditioning regimen, which is typically or almost always EBV associated. And actually you have a very, very small late wave. Uh, and this is only seen in patients who are still under immune suppressive therapy due to chronic uh, graft versus host disease. And here you can see uh, actually the situation uh, in transplant patient is a bit the same as in HIV. So you have in increased um, standardized incidence ratio. Uh, below you see the non-Hodgkin lymphoma in which the SIR is about 10, but also Hodgkin lymphoma is more commonly seen in uh, post-transplant malignancy compared to the immune competent patients. So there is a standardized incidence ratio about, <coughs> excuse me, of about four for Hodgkin lymphomas. And this is an important uh, study from uh, the Australia and the New Zealand dialysis and uh, kidney transplant registry, showing that uh, they compared malignancies before uh, development of um, end-stage renal disease, so before patients uh, went on dialysis with the period during dialysis and the period after transplantation. And as you can see here for uh, lymphoma, you can see that the risk actually is only increased after transplantation, not before, not during the dialysis. So meaning that the immune suppression itself is the most important risk factor to develop uh, PTLD. And then there are several other risk factors, but I won't go into detail because they are less well established, um, but they probably play also a more or less minor role in the development of PTLD. When we look at the pathogenesis, uh, you can make the difference between EBV positive and EBV negative PTLD. So uh, about 50 to 85% dependent on the era of the report and on the population are EBV positive. The green numbers are on our own, our own uh, data and you have 50 to 50% 50 EBV negative. In EBV positive, it's actually clear the immune suppressive medication leads to a deficient EBV specific cellular immune response. Whereas in EBV negative cases, the pathogenesis is less clear. And as I already told, you have early and you have late um, PTLD, they can be, the early ones are almost always EBV positive or rarely EBV negative. The late PTLDs can be EBV positive and EBV uh, negative. And EBV, I think you all know that it, 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 it's, it's herb, human herpes virus 4. Uh, it's uh, also called, the, the, the disease is called the kissing disease. So you infect a person the EBV will infect the mucosal um, epithelium, and, but will also infect uh, um, naive B cells. And this infection will lead to a germinal center reaction in which the cells will proliferate, form immunoblasts, and finally will leave the lymph node as uh, memory B cells. And from time to time, those B cells will uh, release lytic antigens making a person contagious for his whole life. And actually it's a very a clever system of EBV making that uh, EBV persists lifelong in the host, but is also able to persist in the population. And this leads to the fact that almost up to 95% of, of the adult population is infected with EBV uh, worldwide. And during this whole process, uh, EBV expresses latent antigens. Uh, so this means that uh, the, the, the B cell can go through the germinal center and undergo the typical germinal center reaction by means of this latent uh, antigens. And in normal situation, actually this whole process is controlled by 
T cells, in particular CD8 positive T cells, but also CD4 positive T cells, making uh, the process controlled by the body. However, in uh, immune competent patients, this T cell response is decreased and this can lead to oncogenesis. And why does it lead to oncogenesis? Because all these latent antigens, they have oncogenic pro properties. One has LMP1, for example, um, MNA1. They can actually uh, make the, the B cells undergo proliferation and uh, transform. Another way of dividing PTLD is uh, whether it's donor derived or recipient derived. So donor derived means that the EBV is um, transfected by the donor to the patient. And this is uh, the case in the hematopoietic stem cell transplantation in which all uh, PTLD is donor derived. It can also be recipient derived, uh, which means that the patient himself will have a uh, primal EBV infection or a, a reactivation of EBV. And this is the case in solid organ transplantation in about 85% of the cases. But some solid organ transplantation can also be donor derived. And this is mainly um, the fact in patients who receive a graft which contains EBV infected lymphocytes. And this leads to PTLD, which is typically early onset PTLD, so in the first six months, and which is uh, in most cases uh, isolated or, or limited to graft involvement. So these are, for example, kidney transplant recipients with a PTLD in their transplanted uh, kidney. When we look at the presentation, uh, PTLD presents a little bit different compared to normal D DLBCL uh, with a high number of extra nodal involvement. And in particular, the gastrointestinal tract is the uh, organ system which is most commonly involved in PTLD. And the diagnosis, although there are no real uh, prospective uh, trials, can be made with a PET-CT, which has shown a high accuracy in several uh, retrospective uh, publications. Something about the definition. So PTLD means post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. So it's a disorder of lymphocytes. So there is an excessive production of lymphocytes. It develops after transplantation. So a relapse of a lymphoma after before transplantation, when the, when the lymphoma is detected before transplantation and relapse after transplantation, this is not a PTLD. It has to be a new lymphoma after transplantation early or late, it doesn't matter. And it's after an allotransplantation. So an allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation or a solid organ transplantation. You can occasionally see it after autologous transplantation, but probably this has, is due to the profound immune suppressive chemotherapy leading to EBV reactivations. But actually we don't call it a uh, post-transplant, we call it an immune deficiency associated uh, lymphoma. This definition, however, has a lot of questions. Are all lymphomas included uh, in the definition? Is it a cancer? The definition says it's a disorder. Um, and the definition doesn't say anything about uh, EBV. And the WHO 2016 uh, classification classifies uh, post-transplant as one of four types of immune deficiency associated lymphoproliferative disorders together with uh, primary immune disorders HIV and other iatrogenic um, related uh, lymphomas. However, there is a new uh, WHO classification which will um, be published uh, at the end of, of this year, probably. I will come back to this. And the current classification uh, describes four subtypes of PTLD. You have the non-destructive PTLD. Uh, with some subtypes. You have the polymorphic PTLD. So in the non-destructive, actually, when you look under the microscope, the architecture of the underlying tissue remains okay. So you see that it's a lymph node or an organ. Then you have the polymorphic, uh, which contains a lot of um, di different stages of, of um, uh, development of the lymphocytes, and then you have the real lymphomas, the monomorphic PTLD, which can actually be every lymphoma you can see in immune competent patients, but most commonly you see diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, 
but also Birgit uh, plasma cell neoplasias, T cell neoplasias, and finally also classic Hodgkin uh, lymphoma like uh, PTLD. And so the first two can be considered precursor and they are typically EBV driven, whereas the last two are actually true lymphomas and can be both EBV positive and EBV negative. Importantly, about 90% of the PTLD are CD20 positive diffused Hb cell lymphomas. Indolent lymphomas or, or small cell lymphomas are excluded in the uh, WHO classification, except for the rare cases of EBV positive uh, mild lymphomas, but they should be EBV positive. And here you see the differences between the three main um, subtypes. Uh, as I already told, the underlying architecture is preserved in non-destructive PTLD and is instructed in the other parts. And in particular, the EBV association is striking in the non-destructive and in the polymorphic PTLD, whereas it can be more heterogeneous in the monomorphic uh, PTLD. The most challenging is the non-destructive PTLD. Um, as I already told, EBV actually is required. Uh, and as you can see here, this is the reason why. So when you have a reactive lymph node, um, the pathologists need to check the EBV in the transplant recipients because the EBV has oncogenic properties. So you have an, an, the, the normal cells of the green, but when they are EBV infected, but they can transform that these are the dark cells to uh, lymphoma. And if you don't treat that patient, he or she will develop uh, a full-blown PTLD. Whereas in non-EBV uh, reactive lesions, like for example, CMV, this is of course also life-threatening, but it, it, it doesn't um, transform to, to malignancy. So it can lead to end organ uh, damage and to that uh, the CMV but it's not an oncologic, oncological problem. So you really not need to ask in a reactive lesion to your pathologist to uh, perform an EBV uh, in situ hybridization uh, staining. Because if you call this a PTLD, this will lead to, to, to a lot of chaos and a lot of panic uh, in transplant physicians, in patients, whereas it's actually, you can't call it what, it actually is a post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder, but it's not a hematological problem. It's an infectious problem which needs to be um, treated properly um, in, in discussion with the, with the infectiologist. And this is how the new WHO classification will a bit look like. Uh, they will not make separate um, distinction between post-transplant or other immune deficiency. They will call the lesion they will um, add the viral state. So if EBV or HAHEV8 is um, seen in the biopsies, and then they will also uh, um, incorporate a specific immune deficiency setting. So there will be only one type of, of immune deficiency related lymphoma. And this uh, will lead to, to a nomenclature, uh, including those three parts. But um, we expect uh, the new classification uh, in September, October uh, of this year. An important question is whether there are differences between EBV positive and EBV negative uh, PTLD, because as you can see in this table and this figure, the number of EBV cases is increasing. So initially in the 90s, almost all cases were considered EBV positive, but now we know that up to 50% of the cases are EBV uh, negative. And there are a lot of hypotheses. Uh, the role of newer immune suppressive medication may be responsible for the EBV negative. Other infections may play a role. The loss of EBV uh, during the evolution of the malignancy. Uh, so this is called the hit and run hypothesis and so on. So the most important question is whether EBV negative or real PTLDs or whether they are just de novo EBV negative lymphomas occurring in a post-transplant uh, setting. And there are some arguments um, favoring the hypothesis of being a real PTLD, uh, in particular the response to reduction of immune suppression. So some patients with EBV negative PTLD respond to reduction of immune suppression alone. And a second um, argument is that with current treatment with rituximab uh, or with chemotherapy or combination, actually there's no 
difference in outcome between EBV positive and EBV negative cases. On the other hand, when we look at the transcriptomic or the genomic level, uh, there really is a difference between EBV positive and EBV negative cases, with EBV negative cases actually clustering together with immune competent diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So they are less, the EBV positive are less complex. Here you see the copy number aberrations, which are um, clearly lower in EBV positive PTLDs compared to EBV negative. There is one recurrent uh, copy number aberration in EBV positive PTLDs, and that's again of, uh, the of a part of the short arm of uh, chromosome 9. And actually, this is the, um, the, the locus which contains the PDL1 and PDL2 uh, gene. So, to conclude this part, uh, so there are differences also. Uh, when you look at those B-modal curves, so the first year you have EBV positive cases, which are mainly due to the induction regimen and are secondary to EBV infections, which can be a primal infection or a reactivation of the EBV. And then after one year, and this really is lifelong, we have cases of PTLD 25 to 30 years after transplantation, which is due to the immune suppressive cumulative burden, so to the maintenance. Um, and this actually is a consequence of accumulation of genomic uh, aberrations, as you, as I showed that um, late P or EBV negative PTLD is uh, characterized by a high number of copy number uh, aberrations. And then the treatment, um, actually there are three cornerstones. You can restore the T cell function, you can reduce the tumor, or you can target uh, the EBV itself. And restoring the T cell function, uh, the most obvious uh, thing to do is reducing the immune suppression. And although there are no real consensus uh, guidelines, uh, actually all Physicians and all oncologists stop the antimetabolites. They reduce the calcineurin inhibitor dose and continue or decrease the steroids. If possible, you wait for one to four weeks and do response evaluation. And as you can see, these are two large studies from the states showing that uh, it's really different, different outcomes with reduction of immune suppression. So in the one series, there was an overall response rate of 45% with 37% having a CR, whereas in the other, there were rarely uh, responses uh, observed with reduction of immune suppression alone. And all this concept of these um, guidelines are a little bit challenged by recent uh, retrospective analysis of the PTLD-1 trial, showing, for example, that if, you, uh, if a patient restarts antimetabolites, there is no increased risk for development of PTLD. And of course, reduction of immune suppression is organ dependent. Uh, you can do it uh, more safely in kidney transplant recipients because you have dialysis rescue, but heart transplant uh, physicians, for example, will be very careful with uh, reduction of immune suppression because there have been studies showing that if you stop or taper uh, the immune suppression profoundly, that there is a risk for sudden death uh, because of hyperacute uh, re rejection. And when we look at the rejection rates, there was a recent trial showing that uh, actually by reduction of immune suppression, you can, this can lead to uh, rejection rates from 50, ranging from 50 to 40%. A second way to restore the immune system, and this is in EBV positive cases, is, to, is uh, the treatment with adoptive immune therapy. And as I already showed, uh, during the the, the passage through the germinal center, the EBV uh, expresses latent antigens, and PTLD actually is uh, characterized by what we call a latency tree program. This means that actually a lot of latent antigens are expressed on the EBV. Uh, you have also latency two malignancies, like Hodgkin lymphoma, for example, uh, like, like some uh, NKT cell lymphomas. And then you have latency one, which expresses only EBNA one, uh, which is typically for Burkitt lymphoma. And given the fact that PTLD expresses a lot of antigens, makes it very immunogenic and makes it actually the ideal candidate to test uh, adoptive immune therapy. 
and adaptive immune therapy hasn't been done for many years uh, worldwide because it's actually it is labor intensive. There were problems with availability and the costs. And actually you can do adaptive immune therapy in different ways. Uh, so the most easy one is to give donor lymphocytes, which of course can only be done in hematopoietic stem cell transplantation where the PTLD is of donor origin. You can use donor-derived EBV um, cytotoxic lymphocytes, which is also only applicable in hematopoietic stem cell transplantation as solid organ transplant uh, PTLD is mostly receptor-derived. You can use autologous EBV CTLs, but this is only possible in solid organ transplant because there the uh, PTLD is of recipient origins. And the last years, uh, there has been an, an um, expansion of the use of third party C uh, CTLs, which can be used both following hematopoietic stem cell transplantation and solid organ transplant recipients. And I will be short about this, but in the 90s, donor lymphocyte infusion were given to treat uh, PTLD, and it was shown that they really can treat PTLD, but that they were associated with a significant risk of GVHD. And this has led to the interest to uh, make donor-derived uh, EBV uh, cytotoxic lymphocytes, which have activity against EPNA trees. And they have been used for prevention and treatment of PTLD. And I will go shortly about it. This is a study of 140 cases, of which 101 were used as prevention for PTLD and the other 30 for treatment. Um, those viral specific T lymphocytes could be detected up to 105 uh, months following infusion. And here you can see the survival curve showing actually impressive results for uh, lethal uh, malignancy. And when we, you look at the difference between uh, DLIs and EBV cytotoxic lymphocytes, efficacy is almost the same, but uh, the risk to develop uh, GVHD in um, using EBV specific cytotoxic lymphocytes is actually almost zero. So it's more safe compared to donor uh, lymphocyte infusions. Of course, but this is also the case in donor lymphocyte infusions, you can't make EBV cytotoxic lymphocytes for um, umbilical cord uh, blood transplantations. This I can be very short, autologous transplantation, autologous uh, derived uh, EBV cytotoxic lymphocytes, they can be used in solid organ transplantation and they also have been limited uh, used in, in prophylaxis and treatment of PTLD following solid organ transplantation. And uh, they seem to be efficacious, although the effect on the EBV viral load is very heterogeneous and very fluctuating. But it's very challenging to make them. And actually now, uh, I think this is the most promising part of the adoptive immune therapy, is the use of third party. This is our um, EBV cytotoxic lymphocytes, which are produced from healthy EBV positive donor. They are virus specific, they are HLA restricted, and they are partially HLA matched. And so there are, they, they made, some centers made banks covering about 95% of the expected patients to have the, the right HLA restriction. And there have been, the most important are the Edinburgh and the Memorial Sloan Keating Cancer Center uh, banks. Uh, this is the first study from the Edinburgh uh, group uh, showing that uh, treating patients, they, they treated 33 patients with PTLD following hematopoietic stem cell or solid organ transplant recipients, showing overall response rate of 52% at six months with no significant toxicity. And the larger trial was from the a recent trial from the Memorial Sloan Keating Center uh, in 33 stem cell and 13 solid organ transplant, transplant recipients showing actually very uh, promising two years overall survival with uh, third party EBV specific uh, cytotoxic lymphocytes. And importantly, the EBV specific cytotoxic lymphocytes, they cross the blood brain barrier. So they can also be used uh, in the treatment of uh, primary central nervous system lymphoma PTLD. And this has led to a trial. Uh, this is a worldwide trial. It's also running in our center, the ALIVE study. 
which is a phase three trial of the EBV specific, the commercialized uh, EBV specific cytotoxic lymphocytes called tabeleclus cell for solid organ or allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplant subjects with Epstein Barr virus driven PTLD after failure of rituximab with or without chemotherapy. And this is a protocol, I won't go uh, into detail, but um, the, the, the trial is, is, is uh, you can see it on the clinicaltrials.gov with more uh, information. So to conclude this part, uh, so EBV cyt cytotoxic lymphocytes, they can be persistent for uh, many years, up to nine years in the donor derived. They seem to be less long in third party CTLs. Safety concerns are, uh, are, are very uh, promising. So they have minimal infusion related toxicity. You don't see CRS or ICANS like in CAR T uh, therapy. And there is a, a negligible rich risk for GVHD or graft rejection. There have been some resistance problem with different mechanisms, but fortunately at this point they are rare. And the, the trial, the allele trial, um, they actually also offers the possibility to switch from one donor to another in case of uh, no response. Then we can use uh, reducing, uh, we, we, can, we can reduce the tumor by local therapy, uh, radiotherapy or surgery for limited disease or for palli palliative care. But of course, the most important are chemotherapy and, uh, radio and um, rituximab. So chemotherapy, you can give many regimens, but the most important message is that multi-agent chemotherapy uh, has a higher response rates compared to a uh, single agent, but it's associated with a high uh, mortality given the vulnerable situation of uh, PTLD patients. And in the, there have been several trials uh, with um, rituximab, prospective phase two trials, showing actually similar or even better um, responses compared to chemotherapy. And this has led to the European uh, PTLD-1 trial. Initially, it was a sequential treatment trial, giving rituximab to patients with solid organ transplantations followed by CHOP. But based on an interim analysis, this protocol was changed to uh, risk stratified sequential treatment. So patients with rituximab, if they had a complete response on CT, they have a very good prognosis and they can be offered the consolidation with rituximab without chemotherapy. If no complete response, our job for four cycles is given. And these are the final uh, data in 152 solid organ transplantation. Uh, median overall survival of 6.6 .6 years was seen. And importantly, 25% had a CR at interim staging, meaning that they don't need uh, chemotherapy with a very favorable uh, prognosis. And as I already told, there was no difference between EBV positive and EBV negative uh, cases. And the authors also developed a uh, risk factors uh, score or, 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 or uh, identified risk factors. So the IPI is a very important risk factor or risk score in PTLD. As I already told, the response to rituximab and also the type of transplant is important. Um, as thoracic organ transplant recipients have a poor prognosis compared to abdominal transplant. And I won't go into detail about this, but both end of treatment and interim PET uh, have a very, if, if, if they are negative, they have a very high chance to have a very good uh, survival. Short word, in cases patients fail uh, all lines of therapy, autologous transplantation is feasible with a three-year progression-free survival of 62% and overall survival of 61%. Uh, but of course, the, the non-relapse mortality is higher compared to the immune competent patients. So they really need a good uh, supportive care, good follow-up, uh, especially during the first uh, three months. And I won't go into detail, but the rituximab uh, is now standard of care. So the risk stratified uh, strategy, strategy, but of course, this is only in CD20 positive uh, cases. So for other ones like Hodgkin, like T cell lymphoma, like um, uh, plasma cell neoplasias, the most important message is try to treat them as you treat immune competent patients with the same regimens. And if you do that, prognosis really uh, improves. But be aware of uh, infections, of course. 
two subtypes with actually no consensus. The one is Burkitt lymphoma. A several regimens have been used. The only one which I would not recommend is on the reduction of immune suppression and rituximab. The other ones are dependent of the clinical situation of the patient. Um, when you look at risk factors, bone marrow involvement is the most important. So if you have bone marrow involvement, I think EPOC or short intensive courses should be given. SHOP is probably not enough. Uh, we use in patients, in most patients, the double rituximab short course EPOC uh, as described by Dan V in HIV related uh, Burkitt lymphoma. And of course, don't forget CNS prophylaxis uh, in Burkitt lymphoma PTLD. And then the CNS PTLD, this is even more problematic because we really have no standard. Most patients don't um, don't uh, tolerate mitotrexate because they already have uh, kidney uh, dysfunction because of the calcium inhibitors. And here I think the cytotoxic lymphocytes may be in combination with ibrutinib are uh, very promising. But important is that the, the and very important risk factor is the, or, or a prognostic risk factor is the re response to the first line therapy. If you have no good response to first line therapy, prognosis is poor. So you really need to try to treat it CNS PTLD good for the first treatment because otherwise the prognosis is very poor. And I think if you can get EBV cytotoxic lymphocyte and can add ibrutinib, probably this is the most uh, most promising strategy for uh, CNS PTLD. I won't go, go into detail about plasma plastic lymphoma, but you know, plasma plastic lymphoma is often seen in immune compromised patients. The most important is that, uh, that you need to, uh, to add bortezomib in your first line therapy, probably uh, together with, with uh, SHOP and, and um, substituting the vincristine for bortezomib because uh, if you if you use bortezomib in your regimen actually the relapse rate is the lowest compared to other uh, regimens and here you can see that the prognosis these are two errors which are compared that the prognosis for all kind of lymphomas uh, has improved the only exception is t cell ptld which remains a very very poor uh, lymphoma and then the last is targeting the EBV itself. Uh, it's very difficult to target the EBV itself because uh, in PTLD, in EBV-driven PTLD, there is no expression of a viral protein kinase. Um, and actually this kinase is necessary for um, to make the, the, the lymphoma vulnerable to antiviral treatment. And the way to circumvent this is to try to use lytic inducing agents. So this means that you give an agent which uh, leads to upregulation of this viral protein kinase. And if the viral protein kinase is upregulated, you can use classical antiviral agents. And there has been a phase one, phase two trial. We call this the latent lytic switch. There has been a phase one to two trial with arginine butyrate, which leads to expression of the viral protein kinase, followed by ganciclovir, showing promising results, although there were some toxicity um, concerns, but showing promising results. However, this uh, concept was not further uh, developed, but there has been recently more uh, interest again uh, in lytic uh, inducers, and um, one of them is, is for example, bortezomib, uh, which can also lead to upregulation of uh, lytic antigens. And there are several small trials, but uh, they are actually not recruiting very well. And this is probably uh, mainly to do with the uh, worldwide use now of uh, the EBV cytotoxic uh, lymphocytes. I will, I will switch this. So this is an overview of the current treatments. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the red ones are the ones which are given in EBV positive and EBV negative cases. The blue ones are, of course, only applicable in EBV positive cases. So my last word on treatment on the new classical agents. I call them the new classical because they are already incorporated in many immune competent uh, lymphoma uh, settings, uh, like, for example, ibrutinib. As I already told, ibrutinib uh, 
can be active against GVG and growth prediction, making it very promising in PTLD. Uh, there are uh, in vitro data showing that uh, EBV positive um, PTLD uh, has a, a very hyperactivation of the P3K and the mTOR inhibition. Uh, checkpoint inhibitors, inhibitors uh, are very promising, although they should be used carefully and only in clinical trials because of the risk for rejection. And then probably the most important is anti-CD30, as almost 90% of PTLD uh, expresses CD30. However, there has been a recent trial of frontline therapy of EBV-positive lymphomas with brituximab plus rituximab, showing actually very good response rates, but the high toxicity with uh, neutropenia, with infections, with polyneuropathy. So we really need to, to fine tune this. And of course, everyone knows that uh, we, we don't have many trials in PTLD because all classical trials, they include patients with CNS invasion, with immune suppressive therapies, with prior transplantation. So it's very important. And another recent mouse trial was uh, shown that um, using a uh, mouse double minute two inhibitor might also be promising in patients with EBV positive uh, lymphoma. The CAR T's, of course, they are very uh, promising in, in, in other uh, lymphomas. Uh, there have been limited evidence uh, in um, PTLD with two small series, each uh, having three patients with EBV negative PTLD. In one, all three had a at the responses in the other three, none of the three had responses. So it's very difficult to say whether there is a place for CAR-T. Maybe the most promising is by combining EBV cytotoxic lymphocytes, trying to incorporate a chimeric antigen receptor in those uh, cytotoxic lymphocytes, combining the effect of uh, targeting the EBV and targeting uh, the CD19 or the CD20 uh, antigen. If patient has a PTLD, is retransplantation possible? Yes, there have been some uh, registry data showing that after one or two years, you can actually uh, retransplant the patient rather safely, although there seems to be, especially in kidney transplantation, this study shows that the risk to develop a new PTLD or a relapse uh, is 2.8 compared to 0.8% in um, first transplantation. And one last word about prevention or prophylactic or preemptive therapy. Um, do we need that? Uh, actually, we don't know yet uh, because there are a lot of questions. Who needs it? Well, I think everyone agrees that high-risk patients need it, but there is no real definition of high-risk patients. For example, uh, in allogeneic transplantation, we know that haploidentical transplantation or mismatched HLA um, HLA mismatch related and, and unrelated uh, patients have a high risk. So they will be followed by EBV viral load and given rituximab in case of um, increase of the viral load. But in solid organ transplantation, there really is no good definition of high risk patients. Which tests? We now use the EBV PCR, but maybe uh, microRNAs or something else might be more promising. So, um, and how do we need to do it? reduction of immune suppression alone, rituximab or adoptive immune therapy, uh, we don't know uh, yet. And these are two um, examples, one in uh, PTL, in, in solid organ transplantation, the other in um, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, showing that uh, preemptive therapy with withdrawal of immune suppression with or without rituximab actually decreases the risk to develop PTLD compared to historical controls. And this is the last slide showing that uh, for hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, a recent uh, Asian uh, analysis showed that uh, they made a risk score um, based on five uh, risk um, factors, uh, being an underlying aplastic anemia, a partially mismatched related donor, use of fludarabine, use of ATG, and acute GVG with skin involvement were risk scores in their um, multivariate analysis. And so based on this risk score, they made a risk category uh, dividing the patients into low risk, intermediate risk, high risk, and very high risk. And so to conclude, uh, we actually, we know 
a lot at this point about PTLD, but on the other hand, we don't know that much. So we really need uh, to, to increase our pathogenic knowledge, especially in EBV negative, to really look for new trials uh, incorporating PTLD patients or immune suppressive uh, related patients. And I think the WHO classification will maybe an opportunity to really pool all immune deficiency patients in, in, in one in, in possible uh, new trials. And so we also look, of course, uh, with, with biomarkers for predictive and for uh, prognostic uh, biomarkers. And I want to thank uh, all collaborations in our center and worldwide because we have an, a huge uh, network uh, because the patient is centered, as you can see here, but actually around the patient's uh, family, uh, physicians, researchers, uh, virologists, HLE specialists, geneticians, uh, the nursing, the, the, whole, the whole team uh, is important because it's, it's, uh, it's a patient, but there is also a transplant organ which needs to be uh, preserved. And I want to thank you for your attention and um, of course uh, for uh, questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Derek, for that fantastic lecture. I don't think, I just, I have never heard something like this beautiful. Your Thank you very much. Long research. Enjoyed listening to you. A lot of knowledge, a lot of information. And I'm sure all those who have heard you today are enriched with this subject's knowledge. We'll give Thank you, you very two much. minutes rest. We'll give you two minutes rest and just give the answer to the quiz for the postgraduate students. Thank Let you. you. Yes. Uh, I'll just share my screen for that. So the quiz that was asked today was related to an elderly man who had severe anemia. The, it was hemolytic anemia. The Coombs test was negative. There was no drug history. And then you were shown the peripheral blood film in which this uh, rosetting of the red cell around neutrophils was visible. So rosettes of red cell around the neutrophils. The correct answer is neutrophil erythrocyte rosettes, and it is a marker of Coombs negative autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Uh, when there is a, a low teeter, especially IgG3 antibody uh, coating the red cell membrane, and then it links with the FC receptor on the more commonly monocytes, but also neutrophils and forms these rosettes. The exact answer was, in fact, exact answer was given by only one uh, who attempted. The other two were very, very close. And these are the two who were very, very close. And they were second and third in the order as well. Is Dr. V. Arun and Dr. Sumit Mir between 1143 and 1144. Uh, thanks for wonderful attempt. Your attempt was almost 99% perfect. And the winner with the exact answer and the fastest finger fast is Dr. Yoga Lakshmi. Dr. Yoga Lakshmi answered at 1141 and she gave exactly this answer. Uh, you know her, she has been our winner in past. She has been our uh, uh, discussant at multiple occasions. Uh, she's doing her DNB in hematology at Sir Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi. So congratulations to you. And thank you so much for participating. Now I hand over the dice to Dr. Uh, Subhaprakash Sanyal to conduct the question and answer session with the faculty. Subhaprakash. So congratulations to the winner of the quiz. I didn't know the answer, I have to be honest. <laughs> Sanyal, go ahead. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dan, uh, for a very lovely presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I just start the question session. Uh, from my question, and then I just followed with the, my all the panelists' questions. I request all the panelists, uh, whenever you want to put any question, just pose your raise hand, and so that we can follow that and you can ask the question. So our hospital is a very high volume cardiac tra transplant center. We have a more than 100 plus cardiac transplant, trans cardiac transplantation done in the last three years time. So, and we have seen a couple of uh, PTLD, particularly young patients. Uh, one patient, I want to ask one question because that, uh, that when we are discussed with the cardiology, cardiothoracic surgery team, they are little, uh, always very careful about their heart uh, graft function. And they are not very comfortable in doing the risk practice very meticulously. 
So they insist us to move to the more about the chemotherapy treatment plan is a little more aggressive so that they can balance both the way because they feel that if the heart is gone, it's totally rejection and the patient has a sudden death. So my first question is that how you manage this discussion with them and how you scientifically go ahead in your clinic when you see PTLD, particularly in the cardiac transplant setup? Yeah, it's a very good question and, and it needs some some time to to become familiar with each other and to be to to rely on each other um, so we we always discuss with our heart transplant recipients that giving chemotherapy is also a high risk for their patients eh? um, infections uh, other complications because if you if you give chemotherapy you you need anthracyclines uh, so it's 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 a balance and um, yeah we try to convince them and of course, you need a, a, a number of patients that it's feasible to start with rituximab alone to reduce the immune suppression. Of course, uh, they 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 will they will go on with with calcineurin inhibitors. Eh? The the nephrologists they 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 often rely on on steroids alone, uh, for example. Uh, but cardiologists, um, you need to. You need to convince them that they should stop the, the mycophenolate or the, the azateoprine, whatever it's used in your center, uh, and try to reduce at least with 25% the, the calcineurin inhibitors. And yeah, try to convince them that chemotherapy, if you can avoid chemotherapy in a heart transplant recipients, you also have a lower mortality. My second question regarding Everolimus. So I have seen that cardi cardiothoracic surgery guys are very comfortable in the, when they have a restarting, they prefer to stop tacrolimus and move to everolimus. Yeah. Uh, I, I have seen your slide that everolimus has some potential activity against PTLD. Yeah. So yeah. So your comment, please. Is, I think it's a very important insight. It's a very good question. And it's not only in PTLD, it's, it's in all kinds of post-transplant malignancies uh, that switching to mTOR inhibitor is feasible. Although there have been some... Uh, it's registry trials showing that if you use mTOR inhibition early after transplantation, that actually the risk to develop PTLD is higher. But it's it's a registry study, so it's very. But I agree if your if if your cardiologist is feeling comfortable, but you need some experience with mTOR inhibition, and we actually our nephrologists uh, prefer mTOR inhibition more than our cardiologists. Uh, but it's it's a, it's an it's a possible solution uh, to try to discuss uh, avoidance of chemotherapy and switching the calcineurimeter to mTOR inhibition. Certainly, yeah. But we don't know actually what's the effect of mTOR inhibition on PTLD. So I won't give it as a treatment of PTLD, but it can be an an um, an uh, reduction or or, or an, a substitute for calcineurin inhibition. It's a very good suggestion. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Siddharth, please go on. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sano. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dan, for a uh, very nice and very exhaustive lecture. I have learned okay. quite a few uh, things today's lecture. Uh, actually, uh, my uh, uh, whatever I have understood that main um, pathogenesis is because of the EBV uh, and it is the B lymphoid cells. So uh, is there any procedure to deplete the uh, transplant product by uh, using like there are T cell depleted product. Can we deplete the B cells from the stem cell uh, product which are going to be transfused? Is there any method of depleting B cells before yeah. uh, transfusion? There, there is no, the, the, the only, there are some, some small initiatives uh, giving rituximab before the transplantation. Uh, I don't know if, if depletion of the graft is possible. It's not like a, like a, like an um, uh, stem cell pocket uh, which in which you can deplete. But there have been some suggestions to use rituximab, but I have no, um, no experience with it. I think we need to, the, the centers which are doing that, but they are limited. Uh, what are they? We, we need to, to know what their results, but it's, it might be, it might be good. But of course now we, I think, during the last two years, nobody dared to do it because of the COVID, knowing that we took them up. Uh, so, so, but, but I, it might be, it might be promising. Yes, sure. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Dr. Kunal, please go. Yes. Uh, good morning, sir. So, good my morning. question to you: 
Yes, my question to you is uh, the patients who are on uh, reduced immunosuppression, how do you monitor them in between the time frame of two to four weeks for further stratification? What are your uh, uh, parameters to assess and how do you place PET scan in between them? Yeah, yeah. It's, we, we only use reduction of immune suppression alone if there is uh, no, 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 what we call warning signs. So if the, the blood is normal, so if you have an elevated LDH, we always all start reducing up as well. Um, so it, it really needs limited disease. Um, for example, if you have, an, if you have a lung transplant, then, transplant recipients with one nodule, which is actually discovered by incidence, then we do reduction of immune suppression. We uh, ask the, the transplant physicians to see the patient every week to check whether there is any problem of rejection. And then we plan um, an, an CT to see if the lesion uh, has become uh, smaller. If the lesion has become smaller, there is an, a probability that reduction of immune suppression will be alone will be enough. And then we, if, if there is no rejection, we wait for another four to six weeks, and then we do new PET scan. If patient is in a complete remission at that time, it's enough, but we try to convince the transplant physicians to keep the immune suppression as low as possible. If not, we go to the rituximab or, or whatever type it is. Yes, sir, what is the appropriate timing between uh, for PET scan in between two to four sorry. weeks? Excuse me, I, I didn't hear it. Be After between... reducing it. Uh, after reduced immunosuppression, what is the appropriate timing of PET scan? If uh, if we are uh, doing PET scan, not CT scan. Yeah, I think you need to to wait six weeks, at least, if you want to do a PET scan. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. And how do we monitor these patients afterwards? Um, that's a good question. Um, if if it's I, we, we, we actually don't do follow-up PET scans anymore. We look at the clinical picture uh, to see if there is any suspicion of a relapse, we do a new PET scan. Uh, so we, we try to see the patient in the beginning every uh, two to four weeks, uh, combining the hematology and the transplant uh, visits, of course. You don't need to to do them both at the same day because the transplant physicians are also very, very good and very they have a very high awareness. So in the beginning, every two weeks, and then afterwards, at the at the end, after six to twelve months, most patients will 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 be seen every three months. Thank you, Dr. Uh, okay. First to audience, uh, Dr. Krishna Ratam. What is the exact incidence of PTLD in uh, stem cell transplant patients and solid organ transplants? Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's a very good question. And it actually depends on, on the risk factors. If you look in solid organ transplant, the, the overall incidence is about um, 2 to 2.5% uh, lifelong. But of course, there's probably an underestimation because yeah, we, we need we need longer follow-up to, to, to say that it's lifelong, but it's about two to two point five percent with kidney transplant having an incidence of about one to one point five percent. Heart and, and, and multifacial have a high risk. In um, allogeneic transplantation, actually we don't know because we are using more and more preemptive strategies, so we see less PTLD following allogeneic transplantation. And for example, for haploidentical transplantation with an with an T cell with a real T cell depletion in the pocket, the risk is about twenty to twenty five percent. But we don't see it anymore because all protocols now incorporate at least one administration of of preemptive rituximab as soon as you see an, an increase of the viral load. Uh, the same question. That's another question from the same person. Uh, Dr. Uh, does HIV infection increases the risk of PTLD? Yeah, at, at this point, we can't talk about PTLD in HIV. We have to call it HIV-related uh, lymphoma, but, but actually it's the same. Um, yes, and there it's strongly dependent from the CD4. Uh, so if you have low CD4s, uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and in particular uh, central nervous system lymphoma, is, uh, is, 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 is increased a lot with, with standardized incidence ratio. Actually, if your CD4 is all, almost unmeasurable, 
you have actually more than 100 times uh, higher risk to develop um, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. The situation is a little bit different for Burkitt lymphoma, which actually have rather have normal C or, or low normal CD4s. And um, the only thing that we see, the only lymphoma we see more in HIV after introduction of the antiviral, the, the highly active antiviral therapy is Hodgkin lymphoma. And we don't know for sure, there are many hypotheses, but uh, Hodgkin lymphoma is actually seen more commonly after antiviral therapy because it's seen with higher CD4s. And we know, of course, Hodgkin lymphoma is a malignancy with only little malignant cell, but a, but a huge immune uh, component. And probably that's one of the reasons that when you do an, an, an reconstitution of your immune system, system by antiviral therapy, that you can introduce Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, but it's one of the hypotheses. But it's it's dependent on the CD4. Uh, so diffuse large B cell lymphoma, very high risk with very low CD4s. Burkitt lymphoma, we see it from time to time with low to normal CD4s. And Hodgkin lymphoma is a typical lymphoma seen after initiation of the antiviral therapy. Thank you. Dr. Pritesh? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, sir, um, uh, for the nice lecture. And my, in case of allogenic hematopoietic stem cell transplants, the almost always the cause is donor derived. Uh, why not recipient derived? Uh, my question is that. And apart from that, if the donor is always responsible, then do you prefer in your practice screening for EBV prior to transplant? And how, if yes? Yes, um, it's 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 almost always donor derived because it's transferred with with the with the stem cells. Uh, so you have lymphocytes containing uh, EBV. Um, we do we do EBV uh, in the donor, but the problem is that yeah, almost all patients uh, are EBV positive. Uh, so you don't have much choice because if if you in most cases you only have one donor. If you should have three donors with approximately the same uh, age, uh, healthy donors, uh, of course, no pregnancies, then one of the yeah, criteria could be EBV, like you also try to avoid CMV reactivation. So uh, it, it can be a criterion, but in practice, you only have one donor and you need to take it, whether he's EBV negative or she's EBV positive. Uh, we don't have the choice, but it would be, I think it's a good thing to, to put it together with, um, for example, age, uh, underlying disorders, um, pregnancies, uh, like, like that. Yeah, But we don't have the choice, that's the problem. And what prophylaxis do you practice in your... Uh... What, sorry? Do you practice profile access for PTLD in you? No, no. Um, we don't do it. You mean for for uh, hematopoietic or? Hematopoietic. Yeah, no, no. We, we use the preemptive approach. So um, we, of course, our patients are on high but it's not for the EBV because it doesn't work against it. It's for, it's for uh, herpes. Um, but uh, we, we don't, we don't use prophylaxis, but we, uh, our Stem cell transplant, they have EBV viral load the first months, every one to two weeks. And as soon as we see an, an increase in one week, uh, we, we, we try to give them, well, it depends on the symptoms. If they, have, if they really have symptoms, we do a PET scan and, and try to have a biopsy to see if it's, if it's a PTLD. If they have not, no symptoms, we, we give a preemptive furrituximab, yeah. Uh, along with the reduction of immunosuppression. Excuse me. Along with reduction in immunosuppression, you actually the 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 role of reduction of immunosuppression is less well established in hematopoietic stem cell transplantation because it's probably the conditioning regimen which which uh, causes the. But if possible, we reduce the immunosuppression. But it's not always possible. But if possible, we we try to reduce it. Yes. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Dan, just uh, same questions what Dr. Pritchard asked. Uh, in, in our institute, where there is a donor recipient mismatch in allogenic transplant, we do a little more closer follow up of the EBV PCR uh, post transplant. We do. And uh, we just really consult the ID physician straight away so that uh, anything needed to be uh, used uh, in a little early. So, my question to you when, we, when you treat uh, PTLD, uh, EBV positive PTLD, 
and how frequently you monitor the EV with tighter and what is your protocol in the center? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's also a good question. Um, actually, there 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 we have cases we we try to monitor during the. If patients, for example, get four times to take up, we, we do the EBV viral load every two weeks. And afterwards we do it approximately the first three months every month. Uh, but we have some patients who have an persisting EBV viral load, very high persisting EBV viral load for almost 10 years now, and they never develop PTSD. And we have patients who develop, who have no EBV viral load in their blood, but they, they, are, they are refractory because I think there is not always the, the, the association between EBV viral load and EBV in, in organs is not 100%. It's, it's, it's predictive, the viral load, but not complete predictive. So I think you need to be careful. I think it, it's, it gives a, a good feeling, a safe feeling if the EBV viral load becomes low and stays low. But uh, there, there have been, there are some escape mechanisms. But I would, I would follow up during the therapy every two weeks afterwards every month for three months and then you can you can go every two or three months um, with the PTLD because the, the, that's also my expression if patients uh, relapse they, they, they relapse very early you rarely see relapses of PTLD one year occasionally there are so we had now a, a girl with an heart transplant recipients who had a very early PTLD 15 years ago and now, 15 years later, she has a new PTLD and with some clonality, uh, showing that it's the same clone. It's it's very rare, but it's possible. But it's rare. I wouldn't make it a, a common thing that patients will relapse 50 years later. So, so when you monitor and sometimes you feel that uh, there is some one log reduction uh, increase in the EVV titer, but there is no as such lymphadenopathy. So you just uh, keep them just only the clinical monitoring or you do PET scan at that point of time. Uh, no, but, only, only, only if they really have clinical symptoms. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Because, because you, you really need to pay attention with, with, with PET scans because, um, yeah, you, you know that that it's, it's, it's the same in HIV. You have often you have some inflammatory background in immune deficient patients, and it's always, it's that false positive rate is very high uh, with that. Yeah. Dr. Das. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dan. It's a nice lecture. Thank you. Now, the, I think this uh, coming to the preemptive therapy, what Dr. Sanya asked, I'm just taking one brief out of that. The issue is that in those group of patients, uh, which group of patients you do EBV viral load? For example, in allogenic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, which group would you do? And how, how often would you do the EBV yeah. viral load? Would you do every week or every two weeks? And yeah. your decisions of starting rituximab, if you start, how long will you start? I mean, they think the same thing. I think we just wanted to be a bit clearer about that. This yeah. is a practical approach. Yeah. For our genetic stem cell transplantation, um, we we have a follow-up program. Uh, the first two to three months, we, we see the patients every week and we do an EBV viral load. If we see an EBV viral load uh, with, with, an, with a one lock elevation, in one week, uh, we we um, we will repeat the EBV viral load, and it's rising further. Then we will, depending on the symptoms, we will do a PET CT if the patient has symptoms or signs of, of something uh, looking like PTLD. If not, we give one rituximab administration. Um, we do this for two or three months. Uh, at that point, most patients will go to two to three weekly. And we keep on doing the EBV viral load until six months. And then we probably, we, we mostly stop uh, monitoring because most PTLD is seen in the first year. Uh, in solid organ transplant, we only, uh, or, or our transplant physicians only do uh, EBV viral load in pediatric populations um, and in very high risk populations like multivisceral and heart lung transplantations. And uh, can I ask one thing? Can I, what is your rituximab protocol? How often you give? Yeah, if it's just um, if it's just preemptive, uh, in most cases, one administration of three seventy five milligrams per square meter uh, is enough to see an, 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 a negativation of the viral load. 
Um, if not, you can give the standard uh, PTLD protocol, which is uh, for weekly doses of 375 milligrams per square meter. I never give subcutaneous um, when rituximab when I treat patients every week because most subcutaneous um, data are from three weeks or, or longer. So I don't know safety of subcutaneous every week, but I know some colleagues do. I think it's safe, but, but I, I, I always give it intravenous. Thank you. Thank you. So the question from audience by Dr. Raj. So his question is that why the incidence of PTLD is more with a cardiac uh, plus uh, lung transplant or lung cardiac transplant than the other uh, like a liver uh, uh, kidney? Yeah, that's also a good question. I think it's related to the to the immune suppressive therapy, which is uh, they 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 often um, have higher levels for a longer time uh, in heart and lung. Like for example, liver transplantation uh, and kidney transplantation, they are doing now trials, for example, with CAR T regulatory cells in, in HLA A2 mismatched. Uh, and actually, and then there, there are also other trials, they try to reduce the immune suppression. Even in liver transplantation, there are protocols trying to stop immune suppression after some years. And uh, that's, I think that's the most important reasons, reason that's uh, the, the the high uh, amount of immune suppressive therapy in, in thoracic organ transplant uh, recipients. But it's a good question and we don't actually know for sure it's a hypothesis. Dr. Raj has another question. Any comments about the age children, particularly as a higher risk factor and the mechanism? If any? Yeah, I think I think it, it depends on, on, on the geographical uh, situation. Uh, for example, in, in developing uh, countries, uh, most patients are, um, or most children are infected with EBV earlier compared to, to the developed countries. Um, so, so I think um, it's, it's, you, you, you see it, the higher the age you, you are confronted with EBV, the higher the risk to, to develop uh, the PTLD. Uh, so it's it's the most important risk factor is your patient or your, your child in particular is EBV negative and receives an EBV positive donor or has a primary infection at that at that point. Yeah, I agree with Dr. Raj because whatever the PTLD I have seen at the background of the cardiac transplant, most of them are the young adult. Not, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. sure, yeah. sure. Yes, if I get, if I get, um, Ali, did I often get some some male advice from from everywhere, and it's it's often children. Eh? They they really have a, a high risk to develop. Okay, you see more adults because there are many more adults who are transplanted. That's the reason why we also see more PTLD following kidney transplantation because many more kidney transplantations are performed compared to heart or lung. But actually, the risk. It's lower in kidney transplantation compared to heart and lung. Uh, Dr. Pianka. Thank you, sir. Uh, my question, is there any role for radiation treatment and uh, radiation therapy in PTLD? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think um, the role is, is, it has a role in, in very limited diseases if you have one uh, lesion, but actually we now prefer radio, um, uh, rituximab, but if you have one lesion, you can combine reduction of immune suppression with radiotherapy. It also has a role in um, palliative care. If, you, if, if there is a, a, a complication, pain, for example, you can do radiotherapy. Or if, if the radiotherapy is part of your protocol in CD20 negative cases. So we have some patients with central nervous system lymphoma, which don't tolerate any other treatment there, you can give radiotherapy. For Hodgkin, um, it's also a possibility, although I think for Hodgkin, you really need to balance um, the risk to, to give radiotherapy to someone who has already a high risk to develop other malignancies. So in Hodgkin lymphoma, I think uh, as, as we know with immune competent patients, the risk of, of uh, deferring radiotherapy increases the risk for relapse, but it's only a few percentages. So I, I would, I would limit uh, radiotherapy to um, limited disease, which is CD20 negative disease, palliative uh, um, um, radiotherapy, or central nervous system lymphoma, which you have no other 
uh, solutions. But but it's a good question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Tan, I have one quick question. Uh, so single agent rituximab, uh, yes, it's a very common treatment to use. So when the single agent rituximab don't work well, uh, in the cardiac transplant background, in our institute, we are using RCVP because uh, the anthracyclines are very difficult to give for this group of patients because injection fraction is 10%, 15%. So what do you do in your practice? Yeah, it's, it's also a good question. So if the if the ejection fraction is good, we give anthracyclines because they have a good heart in, in that case. So so we are not that afraid because we only give four cycles of our chop in our protocol. We give four times rituximab and then go to four times our chop. Uh, in case uh, anthracyclines are, are not... Um, possible, we actually switch our protocol to uh, gemcitabin oxaliplatinum. Okay. Because we think CVP is not enough, although although there have been some some uh, data in children with, uh, there has been a trial with CVP and rituximab. But I think, I, I don't know what are your results. I have no experience with CVP, but maybe your results are also good. I don't know. Somehow I am able to salvage the patient. I only one. Uh, it's, it's, it's maybe it's it's maybe it's it's a good solution. Uh, I I I don't know. It, it, I, maybe I'm an expert in PTLD, but I don't know that much because we don't know that much actually. But but it's good to to share ideas. Uh, maybe if you have good experience with CVP, it's 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 also a good possibility. Yeah. Thank you very much. Dr. Pitesh, please. Uh, yes, sir. So I want to ask that. Uh, clarity about approach in those PTLD which are CD20 negative apart from therapy role you have explained and uh, approach in those cases which are EBV negative. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, if they are CD20 positive, EBV negative cases, we actually treat them the same with rituximab and if no complete uh, remission, we go to our job. For the CD20 negative, uh, you mean the CD20 negative DLBCLs or, or also the T cell non Hodgkin, the Hodgkins? Uh... Um, overall, mainly DLBCL. Or... Yeah, if, if, it's, if it's a specific subtype, eh, like, like T cell, like Hodgkin, we treat them like immune competent patients. For the rare cases of CD20 negative PTLD, that's, that's, that's a difficult one. Um, and um, we, uh, if it's EBV positive, uh, we try to go for uh, EBV specific lymphocytes. So there has been an expanded access program, but but it's complex. Um, if not, it's treated with with chemotherapy, with shop uh, chemotherapy. Um, but I think, and and it's something we we recently had. We had two cases with CD20 negative uh, PTLD uh, who were treated. Fortunately, they were very stable. So we treated with reduction of immune suppression alone, but both, I'm sorry, both cases relapsed and we took a new biopsy and then they were CD20 positive. So maybe it's, 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 very, it's very important to ask your pathologist, is, is it, are you sure it's CD20 negative? Because uh, these are two cases we had which were CD20 negative and in a second biopsy they were CD20 positive. So it's, it might be, it might be an, an option to, but it's of course at that point, it's a reimbursement, reimbursement problem to, to give CD20 to give um, reduction up to CD20 negative diffuse large B cell lymphoma and try to see if maybe it's it's a it's a pathological uh, artifact. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. So next question is from the audience, uh, Dr. Pujita. Uh, will you do EVB testing in all your transplant patient? Uh, no. No, only in the allogeneic stem cell transplantation and in the high risk solid organ transplantation. So the 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 pediatric ones and the multifissural and the heart lung transplantations, yes. And the others is only in case of suspicion of a problem. Uh, uh, or the rare case of EBV seronegativity in adult transplant recipients. Dr. Dan, I have a couple of questions regarding adoptive immunotherapy. Yeah. So, so how you practice adoptive immunotherapy concept in your bedside? And yeah. what, are the, so, what are the group of patients? Yeah, so um, actually the group of patients, because we are we are involved in a trial, are patients who are uh, rituximab, negative, um, rituximab refractory after our genetic transplantation. And there you have, of course, the advantage that you have all the HLA data of patient and uh, recipient, uh, because it's need to be, you need to know the HLA of both patient and recipient. You need to know the donor origin, and there you can 
they are reliable say that it's it's it's, it's donor origin so there you can actually easily go to EPV specific lymphocytes in a trial for solid organ transplantation um, it, it depends uh, if we if we can predict based on the IPI that rituximab alone will not be enough we do during the rituximab we do the HLA typing of donor and a recipient and ask the, the, the company, so it's, it's a company, it's called Atara, and we ask whether they have a product. And in case the rituximab is uh, not enough, we can proceed to um, another possibility is wait and first give chop. And if they don't respond to chemotherapy, go to the, but actually I think it's more reasonable to say that you try to put EBV specific uh, cytotoxic lymphocytes before chemotherapy. But it's the advantage, of course, of having a trial. Uh, it's more difficult, although uh, th there are now many centers. I don't know the situation in India, of course, but uh, we, we have two, in Belgium, we have two centers who are um, offering the trials, so patients can be referred to our center uh, from other centers as well. But, but it's very, it's very, it, it, it's tolerated very well. Eh? We don't see infusion reaction. We don't see CRS. We don't see GVHD re rejection with those therapy. Yeah, yeah please, Dr. Shai, Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for the great lecture. Thank uh, you very much. Uh, sir, I would like to ask, is there a role of cytogenetic study in post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorders? Of which study, sorry? So cytogenetics, role of cytogenetics. Uh, cytogenetics, sorry, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, we actually, we are now doing in our research and, and next generation sequencing, so with whole genome sequencing. So we are now, uh, we, we have some cytogenetic um, data, but the only thing you can say that the EBV negative, they have a lot of cytogenetic aberrations. They look like diffuse large B cell lymphoma, you see, uh, P53 mutation, you see MIC rearrangements. Um, but um, we are now doing a protocol. We are trying to have a, a couple of, uh, Ali, we have done it, but we need to analyze it. Uh, NGS uh, in EBV positive and EBV negative. And we, we, are, we will try to make a panel of, of targeted genes uh, which are mutated in PTLD and also try to incorporate some commonly uh, mutated genes in diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And we will uh, uh, validate this with a, with a panel of targeted sequencing in, an, in another hundred uh, cases. We have some uh, collaboration with some centers who will send uh, the cases. So maybe in two or three years, I can give you uh, a, a better answer. Uh, but at this point, we, we don't use cytogenetics for targeted uh, therapy, uh, we hope our panel will, will offer more insight uh, into this. And on the other hand, on the same samples, we are also looking at other viruses. So we'll do uh, sequencing of, of different viruses uh, and look at them. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The next question from audience, Dr. Krishna Ratham again. So as we do more haplotransplant now with PTCY, do you recommend routine EVV monitoring in haplotransplant? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, we, we, we don't see that, we don't see PTLDs and, and, and we don't see that much EBV viral load compared with, with the post-transplant cyclophosphamide. Um, um, we, 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 we continue monitoring, but we, we need to use less uh, rituximab uh, with the post-transplant cyclophosphamide. That's, 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 that's true, yeah. Yeah, so now I'd like one question, Dr. Tang, very clearly. Regarding the Barkit uh, lymphoma PTLD presentation. So uh, how you manage that and how their prognosis from the de novo Barkit lymphoma and how do, how do you... Yeah, yeah. we, we, we use the, for, for, for immune competent uh, Barkit lymphomas, we use the, the, the German protocol. So it's, it's a kind of uh, intensive course uh, with methotrexate and with, with a whole cocktail of chemotherapy. If the patient has a normal uh, kidney function, if the patient is um, in, a, in, a, in a, a good general condition, we start with this, uh, um, we give two cycles, uh, most cases uh, will be in a complete remission after one or two cycles. 
if they are in a complete remission, we, we know tolerance is very poor. Eh? Yeah, even if it's a young patient, we had a transplant recipient, we gave two cycles, then we de-escalate to um, that uh, HIV protocol with double rituximab and short course EPOC. Uh, but if possible, we, we use a real Burkitt regimen for one or two cycles uh, to try to, to get them in a, in a first complete remission as soon as possible, because we know in Burkitt that the early response is, is the most important uh, predictive. And then we give two to four cycles, dependent on the stage uh, of the double rituximab short course epoch. But it's our own protocol. It's... it's um, but, but it works well. We had three or four patients now and, and they are all doing fine. If they are not tolerating, uh, if, if, if the kidney function is, is not good, we start with, with short course EPOC uh, immediately uh, because we can't give methotrexate in those patients. My other question is the PTLD Hodgkin's. Is it diff how you treat them? Is it different from the normal uh, uh, protocols or some different? No, we now treat them the same. Um, so we, but we we in advanced stage we uh, you can you can choose between the the escalating protocol with ABVD and after two cycles you can escalate to BCOP or you can start with the escalated BCOP and de-escalate to ABVD. In PTLD we start always with ABVD. Um, and then see if we can de-escalate after two cycles. If they have a complete remission, we, we drop the, we omit the bioma sign. Uh, if not, yeah, we have to go to, to an intensive. Uh, and the radiotherapy, as I already told, uh, told to uh, your colleague, uh, that's a discussion with the patient because we know radiotherapy, it increases the risk, but it's, it's limited. And yeah, you need to balance the, the risk for malignancy, the increased risk for malignancies in uh, post-transplant patients. Yeah. But we actually, we try to treat them the same with two differences. We always choose the escalating protocol. So we start with ABVD, not with escalated BCOP. And we, if, yeah, we discuss with the patients to, to omit uh, radiotherapy, yes or no, and with the transplant physician. Uh, I have seen your presentation that the potential drugs, uh, bentuximab, you just mentioned, the CD30 positive. So do you feel that bentuximab come in big way in the CD30 positive PTLDs? Yeah, I think I think we, we have now treated two patients, one with a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, one with uh, T-cell PTLD, uh, with very good results and with very good tolerance. The, the, the one trial I... I, I um, uh, told was was a, was a trial with rituximab and and they had a high uh, treatment related toxicity. We didn't see that in those two patients, but it's only two patients, of course. Um, but I think it's it's, it's a very promising uh, thing here because uh, for one or other way, uh, the the uh, PTLDs are CD30 positive, and especially uh, you see 30 positivity more in EBV positive cases than in EBV negative cases. There was one small study in, in, I think it was 20 patients or something, but there was a trend for more CD30. It was only a trend and it's a limited number of patients, but that it's seen in, in, in EBV positive. But overall, uh, it's also seen in EBV negative because the largest studies showed that 85% of the patients, and these were all subtypes uh, pooled. So it was polymorphic, it was early, it was T-cell, it was Hodgkin, it was diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, 85% had a CD30 expression. Yeah. So thank you, Dr. Dunn. Well, we have uh, completed our uh, list of more questions from our panelists and there are no questions from the uh, audience. Uh, uh, one thing, uh, it's an excellent presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Session, and your uh, insights, clinical insights are really helping. I'm sure it will change our PTLD thought process from tomorrow. Uh, we, we just uh, think about started getting more PTLD cases. I think we insist our colleague of the, the nephrologist, the hepatologist, that uh, they should be more uh, careful about the PTLD diagnosis. Yeah, and that's, one that's thing, very important. Yeah, that is very important. Uh, and one thing, I'm, I'm very, very a close follower of your Belgian football team. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think you are now the FIFA ranking three, and I'm very close for yeah. But, uh, but we are now going down a bit. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, playing football as well here, and I have a lot of uh, Indian students in our team. So, actually, a few weeks ago, I, I was invited to play in the Indian team, so I joined the Indian team, and we won against the Belgian yeah, team. 
See, I am also a close following of football, and I used to play football in my childhood. Okay. Uh, and uh, though uh, we are just a very uh, small fry now, but we are coming in big way in football. That I can promise. Ah, that's good. That's good to hear. <laughs> so, if if there are more questions, just send me a mail. I will also send a presentation if you wish, uh, Professor Agarwal, to you. Uh, you can you can uh, yeah. you can share it. Then. Sure. Uh, Dr. Manoj, now please. Go ahead. So I, I just wanted to say you are the number one in PTLD. Thank um, you. No, I'm not the number one. <laughs> I'm interested in PTLD uh, experience, but I'm not the number one. <laughs> wow, wonderful. I your, your interaction and your talk was simply amazing. And I guess uh, uh, you made our day today. Thank you so very much. Uh, can't thank you enough. Uh, also can't thank... Uh, enough uh, Professor Dr. M.B. Agarwal for bringing in the best of the academicians uh, on the forum and the Mumbai Hematology Group. Uh, expert discussions today, and I need to name them, Dr. Pranta Chakravarti, Dr. Das, Dr. Darshana Rane, Dr. Siddharth Kumar Ray, Dr. Priyanka Srivastav, Dr. Vijay Ramanan, Dr. Sandeep Vattake, Dr. Vivek Agarwal, Dr. Dev Deep Day, Dr. Sanyal for the wonderful interaction and modulation. You were amazing and I never believed that this was your first maiden forte today. Uh, you were just wonderful. Dr. Priyanka Shamal, Dr. Sishir Patro, Dr. Pritish Patro, Dr. Kripa Bajaj, Dr. Rajat Bajaj, Dr. Akshay, Dr. Nakul, Dr. Murli Dharan, Dr. Kunal Goel, Dr. Dev Jyoti Prasti and Dr. Moipali Ghosh. Last but not the least, uh, experts across the country, across the world, those who have logged in in large number, there were 13 countries where we had representations today, and all of you were a wonderful, wonderful interactive session. And also a big thank, big congratulations to the quiz winner today. Uh, uh, last but not the least, our chief guest today, Dr. Vinas Kofli, for those words of wisdom. All of you have a wonderful Sunday. And please don't forget to log in again in another session of Mumbai Hematology Group. We enjoyed hosting it today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice Sunday. Thank you. Bye.